Of consciousness, consciousness, Oh, look at that! Right? Michael Zinn and Walter O'Neill as one. Yes, today we have a, a great guest on the show, but uh, I'm actually in the same place, so we don't bring him on separately. He's here when we start. <laughs> Amazing! I'm loving it. It's great. Yeah. You're the best. Welcome to the show, Walter oh, O'Neill. How's it going? How's everybody's week? What are you doing over there at this cool looking studio with that great pop art in the back? So we are actually preparing for tomorrow night. We're doing a live stream with uh, Paul Mahas. Um, it's going to be a, a combination of like an interview show with a music show. So it's cool. called Politically Sound um, at the moment. And uh, it's going to be some people from the left and the right and the middle all having conversation and then at one point just deciding hey we should screw all this conversation let's just play music together and oh kind of all right all right kind of show that we are all one check, check, check. i'm digging that that sounds like a lot of fun yeah it's gonna be good i'm excited ah very nice i i've uh, just turned my my camera today for the day now this is my desk behind me but oh, nice. um but I, I decided my desk was such a nice visual Always looks so lovely. So I'm like, I'm always looking at it going, I wish everybody could see this. So now I got the, the totally. computer turned it's around. Like it's growing very nicely back. Yes, you can see my awesome, Who's my the big sentinel. Guy? Oh, oh nice. wow. Ah, that's right. It's changing colors. And on the top, one of my newest, newest additions, I got myself Goliath from the wow. animated gargoyles. He's pretty, he's pretty amazing looking. Oh, I love his muscles. Look at that guy. Oh, he's yeah. Great. He's he's <laughs> sick as can be. So nice. I'm, I'm in good company, surrounded by the toys that I love and love me. Um, and, uh, yeah, life is good. So what was your week like, uh, Michael, before we get into our uh, interview of um, of Walter? Um, uh, what was your um, – any, any major spiritual moments? Um, nothing super spiritual other than meeting Walter, which was kind of spiritual. He's, he's a super interesting dude, which we'll find out shortly. Um, but, uh, you know, things have been going great with the Jackie, the joke man podcast. I actually got to go to a uh, brokerage comedy club last two nights ago. Um, and Peter Bales, who's one of the, the guys on the show the, uh, with Jackie was doing this thing called Stand Up university where he takes five people who always wanted to do comedy teaches them how to do it at, like on a Tuesday night for five or six weeks. And then at the end they get to go up on stage at the brokerage comedy club for the first time ever and deliver a set. So I got to go see that. It was great to be out and to have a laugh and to just be out again and have a nice relaxing night. It's been so long, you know? Oh, that's awesome. I'm going out in a little bit to uh, watch uh, the new Scream movie. We've been doing a, a Scream marathon over here. It's been a while Sweet. since I saw the first two Screams. Uh, I'd never seen, I guess, Scream 3 and Scream 4, which <laughs> I freaking hated Scream 4. It was stupid <laughs> as hell. But Scream 3 was pretty good. Um, but um, it, after uh, my girl went to sleep the other night, I put on this uh, history of comedy. And um, I just found it really interesting because it was it was breaking down like right from the first episode it was breaking down about, uh, you know, going blue, you know, the, which is like what they say when you're a comedian who is using uh, off color language. Yeah. A little and it, yeah. And it was just talking about um, how these pioneers in comedy, um, you know, uh, like Bill Hicks and um, and George Carlin open this door you know and, and uh you know that that for example the the seven words you can't say on television like that wasn't even like an official thing apparently he said these are the seven words you can't say on television and then all of a sudden it like retroactively became so and they were like yeah you can't say those seven words on television um 
But it was very interesting to me because I think that there's a very similar sort of thing that we do here on the show in talking about things and opening up a door to concepts and places that aren't being talked about and people aren't, you know, articulating. And um, what seemed so crazy yesterday that somebody might say, oh, fuck, you know, out loud on uh, during a comedy special is now part and parcel of the whole machine that we got going and um you know people used to go uh, you know they would love the roasts apparently one of the bits of the popularity of the roasts of the comedians and the roasts of the different people um were, you know dean martin at his roast show um the popularity was basically because there wasn't any real adult humor outside of that at the time so like that was the one place where the comedians would come and all of a sudden they'd be like a little bit more risque and right. pushing the envelope um, but it just, it was so interesting to me as, as it's all spiritual, you know, the, the, the idea that there's some cursed word that has power over you and, you oh, you can't hear those words and, oh, like we're some sort of children or, or something like that. I mean, I don't even think the children are children and that right. so many of these words should be being shielded from them. You know, the right. idea that you're making a word larger than a being is just like so silly to me, um, right. you know, because it's not about like that there are bad words. There's just bad intentions. So, you know, if you have bad intentions, it's one thing. And, you know, teaching somebody to recognize bad intentions is a good thing. But not that there are the wrong words to be said. And it just made me very like, oh, we're pioneers and we're changing the conversation and talking about consciousness and all these weird things that people don't talk about that right now are taboo to some degree, you know, taboo right. to some right. ears. But, um, you know, they're not. And tomorrow they won't be anymore because people like us, um, not to pat us on the back, but, you know, people like us are uh, talking about this stuff. And it, it right. opens that door and it changes the way conversations are, are being had and, and where right. people are within the, the lexicon of, of well, that's uh, what I love about this platform and what we're doing and, you know, just the conversations and the, the connecting with other people and exchanging of ideas in a, in a civil way, you know, not in a, you know, Facebook thread way, <laughs> you know, but I just, I want to uh, recognize some, some comments we're getting. We're getting some people welcoming Walter to our show. Uh, Ninja Kitty is welcoming Walter. We got Tim saying hello to Julie. We've got Amanda saying hello to Walter. Um, and I saw that uh, Ninja Kitty was sitting there eating popcorn with cinnamon, which sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Julie is requesting an army of Sentinels because she says you would love them <laughs> and uh uh and then ninja saying hey julie so welcome to everybody good to see you sorry i didn't jump on the comments right away but uh, welcome everyone I'm not in my usual place i'm in i'm in titan studios with Walter. tim lawrence out there he's him and his girl they're getting close to to baby time yeah he sent me a little video of him trying to put together some baby equipment he was just like oh jess I know you've done this before. He's just like, they didn't give me, they shorted me on screws. <laughs> very, very overwhelming. You don't want to put that stuff together right so that the babies don't fall to their death. No, don't worry oh, about it, good. Tim. My message to Tim and all the other people out there who are having babies and think about having babies, you know, don't worry so much. The, the worries go into the babies. And, and you know what? Like, like, think of all the animals that literally have a baby and the baby just kind of walks off after it falls out of the vagina. You know, like th that, that honestly could be what we deal with, you know, here, if we had less of a uh, uh, mind about it, you know, just because something really terrible happened to you doesn't mean that anything like remotely terrible is going to happen just because the baby came out, you know, right. <laughs> into the world, like, you know, feel relaxed and, and know that that will help your child. Totally. Yeah, we were, we were just talking about all of this stuff about how babies come into the world pure and knowing and able to see other realms and we just yeah. cover them up so that they can't see that stuff. And, you know, we'll get into more of that conversation. Actually, let me uh, take this segue to introduce Walter O'Neill to everybody. Yeah. Um, Walter is came into my life this week. Um, and we hit it off like immediately, you know, when you're on that same frequency, frequency with somebody, um, and like every day I come to the studio and he's here and he greets me with a hug. And I got to tell you, man, that is my favorite greeting of all. <laughs> and nobody does it. And, and it's just so lovely. Walter, that. are you stealing my best friend? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to defend uh, myself. 
No, I'm giving no, better no. hugs, Michael. <laughs> not, I didn't say that. I didn't say that, Jeff. He didn't say my hugs were better. I just, no. I just love that there are people out there who still communicate that way. That I awesome. love that the, that you're connecting with somebody who's um, who's uh, matching your vibration. Because yeah. few can, honestly, Michael Zinn. Few can. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But Walter is a multi-talented man, multi-dimensional person. Um, he, I guess. Traditionally, you might call him an actor and a, and a musician. Um, he's, like I said, he was one of the uh, the original cast member of Wicked. Yeah, the! <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> an amazing, amazing musician. Actually, him and Paul just put together an, a parody that you will love. Uh, it's to Something's Happening Here. For uh, what it's worth, Jeff. For uh, what it's yeah. worth, something. Uh, and it's all about the current state of the world and things that are going on. So you will love it. I wish I had the video done. I would play it, but next week we'll play it. Um, and uh, again, I just, I was like, wow, Walter, you would make an amazing guest. And so here he is. So welcome Walter to the live stream of consciousness. Um, I'm welcome going, Walter. Yes. I am going to uh, give him the welcome that we give everybody and say, Walter, here you are on the live stream of consciousness. Okay. What, does that mean to you? What does the word consciousness mean to you? And, and you can tell our lovely audience. Well, I've actually given this uh, a lot of um, a lot of my attention. Um, it's amazing what's happening when you start paying attention. And, um, consciousness is attention. Brilliant definition. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess the first thing I have linked with consciousness, because we all want to think that we're conscious. We're walking around. We're talking. We're eating sleeping mm -hmm. or doing all the different things during the day however uh i link consciousness with a sense of free will free will meaning that uh we are conscious choosers rather than just conscious beings mm -hmm. that we are consciously choosing and and the most uh prominent uh, aspect of that that sticks out to me is that we're we're making choices now 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 so many choices that of course we're in a constant state of trying to push those choices off to other people voting for them giving them our our own power and then we get to blame it on them because it wasn't our fault we weren't responsible but in actuality we chose it all okay we've been choosing since the beginning in fact i would i be i would be i would venture to guess that your life my life your life is the exact summation and and um, structure of every choice you've ever made in your life. Absolutely. So I would say nailed it, Walter. Yeah, let let's try to rather than be just conscious, be conscious choosers. And and the only way that we can be a conscious chooser is to actually be paying attention to the way it is, as opposed to the way it's being presented, and. Um, and seek truth through that because if we're not seeking truth in a constant conscious choice of seeking and then sharing truth and acting on truth, uh, uh, we are going to fail at, at, at anything. And will people say, well, your truth or my truth, you know, whose truth is, is real. You know, my truth is something different than your truth. However, oh my God. Walter, you're hitting on so many things that I want to talk about and expand. About. <laughs> I, I would love to agree that, um, that there are truths, a commonality truth that applies to all of us. And that's the truth I'm interested in. Your truth and my truth are, are small substructures in a whole truth, but just like a drop of water or a spark coming off the flame or the water off the ocean, um, it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, it encompasses the whole truth. So we can all have aspects of the truth, but what should we should be seeking is a larger truth that connects us all. OK, the one that is irrefutable, that no matter who throws whatever at it, it cannot change. And like scripture tells us, the truth will set you free because with that truth and with that seeking of truth, of course, then you can have a clear conscience, meaning that you don't have to walk around with a weight of guilt. You don't have to walk around with a weight of um, of envy or anger or wrath or any of these things that we're subject to when we start interacting with each other unconsciously. Um, we can actually start um, striving to the be, be the best human beings and energetic beings also that we possibly can in any given moment. And that moment I'm talking about is now. And that's the only thing we can prove. We can't prove anything beyond this now moment. All our future comes from this now of being a conscious chooser in this moment. And everything follows from that. 
And as things happen to us or as we create our reality, I would say um, that no matter how bad it gets or how good it gets, it's a, it, it's, it's a ride, just like Bill Hicks talks about. You know, It's a ride. It's not about whether something good or bad is happening to you. It's about your choice of consciousness while it's happening, meaning your choice of perception, uh, your attitude while it's happening is, is uh, the most important thing, i.e. if the zombie's chomping on my arm and the meteor's coming through the ceiling and my breasts are falling off of the Ebola virus, um, I'm still like, is that all you got? Because I'm still here. I'm still breathing. I'm still conscious. And I'm choosing to have a good attitude, even when this is happening. And I can bring this to a personal thing is that you said, what happened to him this week? I lost my brother this week, 66 years old. Oh, next day, sorry, I told him my beautiful car, my Lincoln Town car. And then the next day, my computer crashed. That was the last three, four days that's happening to me. You're now, doing my great, Walter. <laughs> that my entire life could be wiped out right now. Yeah. Because... But bad things are happening to everyone. Our friend just today, uh, Dean, I hope everybody prays for him right now. You know, he just had a fire at his house. He's a musician, makes his living as that. Everything, the entire house burned down. His roommate runs in to try to save his instruments. And the house blows up and kills his roommate. So that just happened yesterday to that friend. Okay? It's happening all the time. But our choice of being a conscious chooser and saying, I still choose to have faith into something better, that something's going to come around then that's going to fix all this is of primary importance to me. My, yeah, you know, Walter, I think you, well, I mean, granted, constantly choosing. We're constantly choosing. It's constantly. absolutely true. Yeah, When you first started saying it, I was like, I was like, yeah, conscious, consciously making choices all the time, constantly. Yeah. We are <laughs> always choosing. And, you know, I'd love to put this in everybody's ear at home. You know, this, this can be a really hard uh, lesson for people um, when it comes to things that we don't like, you know, uh, oh, somebody died or I, I got raped. Rape is a big one. You know, something like that. Any version of rape when your free will is infringed upon, something has been forced upon you. It's very hard for people to wrap their head around the idea of taking a certain amount of personal responsibility for those things. But, you know, you said it best, you know, there, which version of the truth, which side of the truth? Well, what does it say also, you know, in scripture, it says to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So what does that mean? That means if there's two versions of the truth, in order to do unto others, we have to do our best to meet everybody halfway. And that includes every bad thing that's ever happened to us. Is there a factor of that thing? that is outside of us that we couldn't control absolutely but how how and what you know we can control is as you say walter you know our reaction to the thing do we let that thing define us do we let that thing change how we're looking at everything um a long time ago when i um had my first big sort of spiritual awakening i remember being struck very quickly by this notion that my body was one of those uh, gelatin um, men that uh, the Mythbusters would always use as yeah as a like a, as a as a target on Mythbusters they would shoot all sorts of things into it and they would make this mold and it was just like that guy who was the the punching bag and I saw myself basically being shot with negativity, being shot with experiences that were scarring me and that they were going into me. All these little experiences were drilling into me. And I realized that like these things weren't replacing pieces of me. They were just kind of like squeezing their way in there the way a, a bullet does. And then I saw that at some point, as I filled with this negativity, all these bullets that I'd been riddled with, a, a flip happened. My perspective changed and I started to believe that I was the negative experiences. I believe that I was the scars and that these other little pieces of me that were off to the side of where I'd been shot, those were like, yeah, you know, sometimes things are good. Sometimes things are right. You know, but largely I am this person who has been hurt and scarred and like, and I saw that it was just like a, a, a switch flipping and, and that I could flip that back the other way. And that even better than I could flip that back the other way, the things that were negative that had happened to me and that had transpired, they were finite. And by finite, I mean, I can count them. And 
the reality of what is good and the reality of, of love is infinite. It's infinite love and infinite possibility, infinite good things that could happen and finite, a countable amount of negative things that had happened to me. And don't allow a countable amount of negativity to become you, to become your experience, because the experience of life and living is infinite and infinity trumps anything that is finite by an infinite margin that's the amazing thing it's not even like well take away these amount that you could count count to googleplex count as high as you want it still is just a little little rock skimming off the surface of the infinite ocean that is everything it's it just everything is dwarfed by infinity so don't allow yourself to lose faith and lose hope and lose your enthusiasm because I was hurt before because you know I, I've been injured before or somebody I know has been hurt before that is paying and 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 adding to the negativity which is just this big and so, everything else is so much bigger you know so yeah. thank you so much Walter for that you know Amazing. That's the, explanation. the most in-depth answer I think we've gotten to that question but yeah absolutely well, I would like to uh, just go a little bit farther. Yeah, please, Walter. Sure. You were saying that, and we're reacting and reacting and reacting. When you become a conscious chooser, you no longer are reacting. Mm -hmm. Then you become an actor, meaning that you are no longer a victim to circumstances or to even, you know, love circumstances, anything. You're no longer playing the victim card, which is, seems to be very, very popular right now for all of us to be victims. I could play the victim card this week very easily. But yeah. The reason why I shared those experiences I just had with you was to show it's not because I didn't love my brother. It's not because I didn't love my car and need a car right now. Hey, everybody, I need a car or a truck. Uh, <laughs> uh, put it out there <laughs> preferably um but uh and it's not because uh i didn't i don't need a computer because i obviously do need that too uh i depended on my macbook to, to do to do this kind of work too um it's because i understand that you know we just wait and see now and all i have to do my only duty is to keep a great attitude and to choose how to perceive this this could either be a great loss or for my brother could have been that maybe he was relieved of the pain of his cancer finally for my car maybe i'm supposed to come into the car i'm supposed to have but until i lost that one i'm not going to be able to get the one i'm supposed to have as far as the case, all of it you can you can use this very clear logic for everything because we were talking about that last week about um you know sometimes enough, my mother used to say you'd see the bodies of your enemies float by so just give it time <laughs> yeah and, and last week you know it was being talked about and again and i i love your perspective walter and and if you can choose to see or to allow yourself the possibility and i know you know being really um you know if you're trying to think like bill maher you're like i just lost my car and it's completely random and like okay <laughs> well does that help you to think that i don't see any value in it i do however see value in the notion that you could flip that perspective and think, well, perhaps I've lost this car because there's another car that is more right for me and I'm going to find a better car or there's a better situation. Or if I kept driving that car, I might have gotten to a car accident and then there is something better coming, you know, right. or that this was the time for my brother to to leave this earth because it was, you know, as painless as it might be, or it was a, a matter for him to, you know, do what he's done. And now he's on to the next side because he has to help my mother. He has to help my father. He has to be a, a critical aspect of the universe on some larger level, or there's a baby about to be born and his soul's going into that one. He's got another fresh life. He's going to be riding that roller coaster in the dark yeah. really soon. You know, <laughs> We can look at these things and be devastated by the effects of them, the, the, the momentary effect of them, or we can try. And I, and I know it's hard. I literally just like experienced some things, you know, just like last week or whatever, where I was just immediately like, Arr! and Julie was politely reminding me what I believe. And she's just like, Hey man, you like feng shui. You got to move that piece of furniture out of the way so you can get the new one. Right. And I'm like, ah, yes. Okay. Yes. Damn it. Totally. You know, but it's true. And, 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 or at least it can be true. And I mean, that's, again, the thing of that, 
do unto others, you know, the, the, for, for the Bill Mars of the world, you know, their perspective is, is true and fair for them. And if they feel right. that way, then that's true. But you can open a new door to another way right. of, of looking at everything. And that way is equally valuable. Um, I just want to acknowledge some comments here. Uh, Angela is quoting one of my favorite philosophers, and she says, the truth will be what we decide the truth will be. You know what song that's are, from. Are, are, you are you quoting Juggernaut? <laughs> Woo yeah. Um, can I, can, you know what's really funny is that I wrote that when I was not spiritual at all. I, you know, I was, I was always a, a very good, I, I was always, always an idealist and always a good natured, uh, you know, guy, but I, I was an agnostic. I, I didn't believe very spiritual things. Very funny though, because I listened to my album sh like a few years after I became, um, spiritual and like, I put it on thinking that I was going to hear like idiocy coming out of my mouth because my perspective wasn't there. And I was blown away by actually how spiritual it all was. <laughs> like all of it. I was just like, wow, this is actually really, Jesse, you're pretty close to on the money considering you had no idea what you were talking about. Um, but I, I thought of like the real 3d physical practical world in a very spiritual way. And it, and it continued on. I want to, um, put to, to answer another comment that I saw, um, Tim was uh, talking, you know, we were talking earlier, Tim, he's got a baby on the way and his, um, his girl, Sonia, she's worrying a bit, you know, her family's got COVID pretty bad right now. And, um, and they're in the Rio jungle. So, you know, not a great place to be sick. Um, Tim, as, as sweetly as you can pass on to Sonia, you gotta remind her that she is the incubator for the new life and the new life is fearless and pure and happy and loving and her fears can go into that little baby and it as a responsibility that she has carrying that child it is in her best interest in the baby's best interest in your best interest for her to try and uh and what a gift that is to have that excuse to not worry <laughs> it's a good excuse to not worry don't worry about your family it's all going to work out because you need your baby to keep incubating in peace so you know tell tell her that you know from from, from her to her to me I, 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 from with love <laughs> right? it's really true and, and walter and i were talking earlier about most of what we've been talking about here most of the stuff you brought up um but just the power of words and the power of thoughts you know oh, yeah. again like, like you said like she's thinking these things because that's kind of what we're conditioned to think but take the power of those thoughts and make them into those positive thoughts and, and yield positive results. Is what it, is it? Oh, sir. Let me get it, you, Walter. You talk it came out to a couple of, couple of laws 10 years ago. I'd been teaching them for years, but finally the mathematicians agreed with us, the scientists, the science. <laughs> and one of their laws, a physics law is uh, what we continuously repeat becomes our reality. Yeah. What we continuously to repeat becomes our reality. The thing that we do the most, we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts per, per minute. Most of them are operating in the body, stuff like this. We have about five conscious thoughts per minute, five conscious ones, average. Okay, studied in the lab and stuff. Mm -hmm. Out of those five conscious thoughts, we're oscillating uh, from the past to the future, the past to the future. Seldom are we staying in the now moment. And in the past, of course, uh, when we oscillate there, we're just supporting lies because everything that happened in the past is already being filtered through our singular perspective, our, our perception, and um, our dirty filter of our environment and everything we've gone through in life. So that's your truth, their truth, you know, your separate truth that keeps you separate. Mm -hmm. So that past is a lie. Then the future, you couldn't tell me I was going to do that. All we can talk about is probabilities. The probability that I'm going to finish this sentence. Of course, <laughs> that sentence, that the probability was very, very high. The highest probability that I wasn't going to finish that sentence because I'm on this podcast. I'm you probably podcast. didn't create an alternate dimension with that sentence. <laughs> right. So, so we're constantly oscillating from one lie to the next. Past, future, past, future, past, future has nothing to do with the truth, which is now. And you had mentioned something else I just wanted to touch upon, and I'll make it fast. No, you, you, oh, yeah, you don't have to make it fast. You're our guest. 
Oh, okay. Uh, so you had mentioned do unto others, and I so respect that, and I so appreciate that. But for the people out there that don't understand that phrase, number one, that was a golden rule uh, given to us by Christ. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. When they were about to crucify Christ, according to the story, uh, all his uh, apostles are running around for three days. Oh, what do you mean you're going to be gone? What do you mean you're going to die? All this stuff. And he goes, Oh, ye of little faith, you know, I walked on the water, I fed the masses, I calmed the storm, I brought the fishes in the nets, I uh, brought Lazarus back from the dead, man, I, I did it all, okay, and now I'm telling you, I'm going to come back after this too, okay, so, all right. All the stuff I've done for you, everything I've told you, I'm going to weigh it down because I'm a loving God. I don't want to make it too complicated. I want to be able to reach every single living being on this planet with this concept. So I'm going to give you two real simple rules. And you don't stop at these rules, but I'm going to give them to you. Love God above all things with your whole heart, your whole soul, and love one another. So first of all, we have to look at those two statements. He says, you don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to burn incense. You don't have to eat my body and drink my blood and do all these strange rituals that seem to be tied in with something other than what, um, what he was driving at. Um, all you have to do is love God above all things with your whole being and love one another. Do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Now, the thing I think he left off of that phrase, not because he's imperfect, but because uh, he wants us to do our own thinking and, and wear our own mantle is do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Number one is because what you're doing unto others, you are doing unto yourself. It's a, it's a matter of physics, okay? It's we all are. God. It's all one. It's all one thing. So because, that's the other thing. See, yeah. you know, like, like and I'm sorry to interrupt, Walter, but like when... When it's put like that, I find so often, you know, it really kind of can rub a lot of people the wrong way uh, because yes. there's all of these weird notions that people have about God and God is this insurmountable, huge thing that is above you. But at the same exact time, God is equally just you. And every little molecule of your being, you know, the rocks are God. The cat is God. You know, the, the ceiling is God. The ground is God. So is this microphone and computer and you and you, we're all God. So, you know, these, those two things, they go hand in hand to say, love God is to say, love yourself, love the other people and do to the other God that you see every piece of it as much as you would like to be done unto you behave as though you are everything and everything is you and that you love everything and you're going to do that your best to be kind to every little droplet of everything because it is all just different manifestations of you know what people have called god you know and there's so many different words to call i used to call it the uh the cosmic fishbowl because I, I just liked how that so sounded because it didn't make me think of all the things that god tended to make me think but when you really come down to what it all is and what it all means it's just this real universal um bedrock that that everything is built upon right no doubt and and to have a sense of first of all because they, they do have a good argument of, oh, well, love God above all things. Well, I don't believe in God. What is God? God, you know, God doesn't exist in my life. I don't see any evidence of it. So first, we, we I think we owe it to ourselves to explore what is God. And and I have come to the conclusion after mass experiments and in, in, in so many levels that we take hours to talk about uh, that God is a fabric of everything just like what it says in scripture he says he doesn't always just say i brought you know this world to you he says i also hardened pharaoh's heart i gave you lucifer i created the evil you better respect me because the start of wisdom is to fear god because i bring it all okay i'm the good and the bad i am the duality together and i'm a conscious duality together so don't mess with me now the picture Wait, I, can I just can i just <laughs> add to what you're saying real quick because the fabric of everything that's really that really is inspiring because, you know, what I've been looking at for a lot in my meditations lately is can best be described as the fabric of everything. Awesome. Whatever you're looking at is just molecules, right? There are all these molecules, but these molecules are actually infinitely separate. The space in between them, depending oh. on your perspective, goes on for forever. So if we're looking at, you know, the, the, the molecules of my fingernail, 
you know, every single molecule is infinitely far apart from one another. And essentially, if you look at it, you know, at a certain level, it's just a dot with an infinite amount of space between the next dot. What is that other than a fabric? That's exactly what fabric looks like. You know, there's a bunch of holes in the blanket because the fabric is crocheting and, and zipping around all the things. And in between, it's holding up all these molecules. God is the fabric of everything. You know, know, when we think of God as a dude with a beard, it's just it's so stupid and limiting. And it just it just really misses the point of what is God actually? He's the fabric in between every molecule of everything, you know, like uh, that that is in creation. The fabric. That's great. And get this. We measure time by the time it takes light to go from one place to another. When it gets mm -hmm. far enough distance, we call them light years. But we are measuring time even with between me and you, between me and you and you seeing what I'm doing right now, hearing the words I'm saying. It's an infinite amount of time because yeah. the fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, we have microseconds built in there. Time is measured by creating separate identities and the distance between objects. Without distance, there is no time. All right. Without mm -hmm. distance between separate conscious identities right. there is no time so we're going oh well this is really interesting so what we are are separate entities experiencing ourselves okay trying to apply the rules of the one the entire fabric to a separate entity that has to re forget part of that it's part of this whole fabric in order to even maintain its separateness which is pretty mind-blowing yeah Totally. It's it's really it's amazing. You know, you said a couple of things earlier. Um, you know, <laughs> you were saying, you know, if you, anything that's repeated enough, it becomes, you know, reality. A part of you. Yes. It and becomes that's reality. That's and, you know, that's why they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I mean, that's why when you really start to come into a new bit of consciousness, it's hard. It's very difficult to get yourself thinking in new ways because you have literally, you know, I said it to uh, my girl the other day, you know, like, like basically uh, a tread, you know, the, the longer you, you slide a, a, a stick across the ground, right? It just keeps getting deeper and deeper. You move a little bit more dirt away and eventually you're digging a hole. You know, and that's what you kind of do within yourself. You you make a crease that's really easy to fall into in your mind. And it becomes this patterning that you're getting into over and over again. Um, but, you know, I wanted to get back to what you were saying about speaking, you know, and it's 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 been said many times, you know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And so I often when I'm yeah, when, when I'm working on like a song, um, the most powerful uh, bits of communication that you can get. You'll kind of sit there and you'll think about all the different ways that there are to say something because each differential between how you can say something, um, I like you, it's good, it's positive. Whatever. If you keep collecting them into a big ball, essentially you'll eventually get to a point where you've got the encapsulated idea of joy, you know, or of love or whatever it is. If it's about a song about getting broken up with or something, if you touch every different way there is to sort of feel about that, if there's every single way that there is to think about that, eventually you get it all kind of, um, you know, like cattle, like rounded up into a little space and the energy inherent in what you are saying becomes way more powerful because when we communicate, it isn't actually the word so much. It is what we mean, you know, what the actual um, thought and feeling in why we're saying it, you know? So if you say, please, you know, and it means, I'm sorry for everything I've ever done wrong. And I, I really am hurting and I've been hurt for too long. You, you can hear the difference in somebody saying, please, when it has happened and this thing's gone on for a long time and please, please, you know, that you, we, we call people good actors when they're able to reach into that place, but it's really about finding the universal energetic resonance behind what we're saying, what we're thinking, what we're feeling. Um, and I, I'll give you a, a great example that you're welcome to use in the future. Uh, I, I was constantly told it's not what you're saying, 
because obviously what you're saying is usually based in something that is not going to be refuted easily. It's all, it was always, well, it's how you say it. And I'm going, well, because I'm passionate about something um, does not mean that I'm negative or angry. It just means I'm passionate about these ideas because I feel like we're onto something that's going to help a lot of people if we can get our minds around it and get through it and all of that. So I would use the example of it's not what you say, but how you say it is you got a dog and you go, come here, little doggy. I love you. I'm going to slit your throat and drink your blood. And he's going to pee himself. He's so happy. Or you can go, <laughs> good dog. I love you. And that, and, and that will not go over very well. He's so terrified. <laughs> right? so, yeah. so what was it really? It was pitch. It was tone. It was yeah. rhythm. It was timbre of voice. It was uh, 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 volume. So volume, timbre, and pitch and tone and, and rhythm actually superseded, kind of like music, superseded the actual intent of the words. Now we're going to take it back even one step further. Imagine if we have a secret language and the secret language holds the power of the multi-dimensional universe and that that secret language has been taken from mankind and misconstrued so that every time we're saying certain words, we're actually enforcing negative entities and feeding negative entities and feeding negative, if you want to call them gods or demigods or whatever it is that we've called them throughout history. And that um, when we become conscious of the root of words and really study language, the actual sound itself, you're going to start to notice all sorts of commonalities with certain words and with certain sounds and what they've been used for. So Christ, oh, yeah. Christ is a, is a word I use a lot when I am referring to the, 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 the idea of the son of God, the greatest story ever told. And the reason what brought me to Christ the second time on a much more depth, and I, I want to touch upon this with the words too, um, because I, it's my responsibility to do so. I have, a, I have a platform right now that you guys are so graciously giving me, and I want people to understand they don't have to apologize for having faith in, in, this, in this being we call Christ. And this is why, because when we become conscious choosers, and if we truly do have free will to choose consciously, if we don't have free will, then, you know, blow my head off right now and dig a grave and toss me in. Because if I'm just a robot to be controlled by some other being and I don't have any say over anything that happens to me, who wants to be, who wants to be alive in that type of scenario? I certainly don't. That's not for me. OK, I want to have my chance to to be victorious and, and to fail. That's so important to me. So for me, the idea of no, not having free will isn't an option. I don't want to be alive. Now, I want to be alive. So for me, I am consciously choosing that I do have free will, even if it's an illusion. And this, in turn, actually um, free confirms free will, <laughs> that even if I don't have it, I'm choosing it. And you better keep your eye on me because the second that you let go that leash, man, I'm gone, just like a dog. <laughs> so now I go, okay, I am choosing I want to be alive, so I have to choose I have free will. Now, if I'm going to have free will, then... It's either me or something bigger than me. Now, if you're just doing it all on your own, then all you have is the power of you, which for some people, that's a lot. But who has more power, me or me and you and you? Obviously, the three of us have more power. So think about something so big that you have access to it that's helping you all the time if you just let it in and have faith it exists. As far as the greatest story ever told, well, I did a show on Broadway called The Tale of Two Cities. And uh, uh, one of the famous last lines is, it's a far greater thing I do now. It's a far greater thing I'm giving right now than I've ever done before in my life. He gives his life for the woman he loves so she can go marry another guy. Okay. And he gives his life for her. And I went, well, that is the greatest gift. It's the reason why I was in that show because of what it said. It's the greatest gift you can give another being is your own life. Once you've done that, it's game over. There's only one story where that being gave his life for all other life. And then not only did he do that, but he forgives everybody while they're killing him. And then not only does he do that, but then he says, is that all you got? Because three days later, he's back again going, boom, see, it didn't hold power over me. That's my gift to you. Now use it or you lose it. So the greatest story for me, 
there's no other story. I mean, the Krishna holds some of these aspects, and there's pre stories that predate Christ. But the greatest all-around story for me is Christ. And so if I'm going to get to choose a conscious chooser, then I'm going to choose the greatest. Why am I going to settle for something less than something that's going to give its life for me? And all I have to do is accept the gift mm -hmm. I accept. Nice. And so that's how I came to Christ for logical minds, because I knew I couldn't be a gift. Faith, uh, 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 Christians that run around and they just have faith, no matter what the contradiction in the Bible are or whatever, and they don't think through it logically, then are going to always be challenged and always have their own doubts about that. Oh, yeah, but that doesn't make sense. And that doesn't make sense. The Bible doesn't have to make sense for me. The greatest story has been told and I choose it. Well. You know, when it comes to that, you know, Walter, for, for everybody, because, you know, again, it is it's free will, you know, so I like to give everybody an out, you know, and, and a, you know, when I used to have um, prophetizers come to my door, I would uh, I would literally take an hour out of my life to sit there and tell them that under no circumstances would I be saved by Christ and that I'll see them in heaven. And uh, it's going to be great. I'll see you there. And uh, I'm a good guy. You're a good guy. Seem like a nice guy, but I don't believe in this. You don't go around telling people what they should believe. Um, you know, and, yeah. and, and, but even I as I transformed, you know, what I came to was, was a, a really wonderful place, which I'm sure you probably agree with. Um, you know, now I spend that same hour going, Hey, Jehovah's witness saved by Christ. Hell yeah. Have you been saved by the trees, by the stones? Have you been saved by my baby inside? Have you been saved by everybody on the planet? Have you humbled yourself to every single idea and concept that is in existence? Because just to choose one is, is really folly and is missing the ultimate message of, of Christ. You know, the kingdom of heaven is, is in us. And, and yeah. And that, that means that it's in the Buddhist and it's in the Muslim and it's in the atheist. It, it's in everybody. So, you know, we're not supposed to judge. Yeah, we're not supposed to judge. We're supposed to allow that free will, just like you said. You know, we're not supposed to take away everybody's free will. Um, you know, we've got a, um, a a a a guy in the the comments who really does not understand like what we're talking about at all. You know, uh, and, I, wanted and, to, I wanted to. No, wanted that's okay. To, hold, hold on, because I because I, 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 I have something to say, but it's. It's for everybody to discover. You know, I, I'm not here. We're not here to sit there and be like, yo, Seth, you're you're a dummy. Hey, whatever Seth believes, totally cool. You know, like even if I, I actually, even if he's going about saying it in ways that are insulting or, you know, if, exactly. if I was more sensitive, I might be like, oh, man, Seth, you're I'm not wearing my glasses. So I can't read the insult. Oh, good. It, oh, it's it's, it's, the it's silly. I, I'm really proud of our, our group for just generally ignoring know. it. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I don't think anybody's ignoring it. I think everybody, Seth, welcome. With yeah, much welcome, audience. Seth, man. Welcome here. I mean, I I, I was going to pop up your comment, your first comment. No, not that one. I no, I, uh, I saw his. I went to his yeah. page for a second, and I see he's he's a, a gamer. He's a video game guy. Oh, um, and um, and yeah. like you know, and I this isn't exactly the conversation maybe for you, because I don't really think that you're thinking in the terms that we're thinking of, but I challenge you, Seth, to go back to the earlier videos that me and Michael produced when, uh, when we were teaching the 13 universal laws, which are based on Kabbalah, based on, um, the, um, uh, hermetic principles yeah. and based on a lot of, religions and cultures all around the planet that have basically come to believe that we're all one. We're all, every molecule is coming from the same original big bang that we're all a mind because literally solidity and liquidity, these are all ideas. Time is just an idea of experiencing things and that we're all living in a polarized mind of the universe or of God, whatever you want to think of it. We go into a lot of detail in some of these things, but we're kind of, advancing the conversation in all of the conversations that we do here on the live stream of consciousness. But honestly, um, I challenge you, man, go check out some of the things that we talked about. We've yeah. spent a long period of time talking about why we think the way that we think we're not the only ones. We are literally talking about things that have been talked about. Many, 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 many books have been written about and the Bible and then the Quran and every religious subject matter of all time has been talking about these things. And we've gotten lost 
in some of the details and some of the words that are being used to describe the things. And we're trying to get back to a more universal vibrational understanding of oneness, of consciousness, of trying to treat everybody else the way that you would like to be treated. Like case in point, Seth, if you right. were doing a YouTube show and these were the comments that were coming up on the thing, how would you feel, man? Yeah, I mean, yeah. granted, I've dealt with I'm, you know I'm people being jerks to me before, so it's not really a big deal. But I would love you to know, know how Seth, how did Seth, how did you find us, Seth? I would love to know. And again, you're totally welcome here. Stay and join us. Yeah, uh, stay and enjoy, and I hope to, uh, hopefully yeah. you'll uh, you know, say what you say what you need. You'll to get say. something out of it. Um, you know, it's interesting. Earlier, you brought up Bill Maher, and yeah. And, and so, and just the way I love Bill Maher. Bill Maher used to be one of my big, like, yeah, guiding I mean, lights like for a long time, but he's uh, he's stayed where he's at, and you know, he's, he's very he's practical. A bit of a cynic. Yeah, he's a bit. Yeah, he's a, a bit cynic. of a cynic. Cynic's and, a good good term. And today, I heard I heard him say uh, it was a little sound clip, and he's like, "There's no such thing as karma, dudes. Like, come on, people. What?" Ooh. And I'm just like, "Wow!" <laughs> I just was like, "Poor Bill Maher." Poor Bill Maher, but but you hit it on the head. You were like Bill. It's, oh, it's you watched that Karma video too. I watched that video too, and yeah. it was really fun. This is an interesting little conversation. So he was talking all about Karma, and basically, um, I actually love what he was saying at baseline. Baseline, what Bill Maher was saying. I'm not wishing Karma on anybody, and isn't it cynical that we all think of this? Con this term this uh concept of karma as just being the universe is gonna get that motherfucker you know like like right. if you get upset enough karma is gonna step in it's gonna go get the guy and he was talking about karma as a positive sort of philosophical type of uh you know idea where mm -hmm. that um you know actions were manifesting in more positive sort of ways and and and, and things were working themselves out uh and i appreciate what he's thinking at the same time i was also a little bit like oh bill like there's so many books i could get he said something about how I think that we would know about reincarnation. I think something would have happened by now. Dude, go read Many <laughs> oh Lives, God. Many Masters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many Lives, Many Masters. Anybody who wants to know that reincarnation yeah, is the real know. deal and there is a lot of weirdo evidence to support that idea, go read that book. And there are so many more books on the subject that are convincing to say the least and you know ultimately when it comes to somebody like bill maher and i used to be very much a bill maher it, it gets down to not trusting the other people who are having their human experience and discounting uh firsthand accounts somebody told me that this happened to them or they experienced this and i go well i doubt that on some level maybe that guy's crazy that leads to people being cynical like bill maher and going there's no evidence Trust me, there is evidence of all sorts of things if we are willing to entertain the personal experiences of the other people on the planet. And we're supposed to be respectful and honoring them and being kind to them, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's what you say? a physics law of cause and effect. I mean, yeah. so everything that physics is always catching up to the spiritual masters. It's, it's, cracks me up. Then when a scientist says it, oh, then it's true. But, you know, people that we killed for this information, that, that it, we, we don't even listen to it, you know? Oh, yeah. They, they're saying something different. Let's kill them. Oh, it's right? Oh, sorry about that. It's um, very um, disappointing. You know, there, there, what, can I just say, there are so many ways to achieve the same thing, you know? And, and like, if we simplify something down to, if you have a cold, I think we could all agree there's a lot of approaches that you could take to getting over your cold faster. Whether you were going to go gargle with some salt water or you might go to down to the store and get something like a Dimetab or maybe you wanted to have some honey or, you know, th there's a lot of approaches to or, or even just drinking a lot of water. You know, like a lot of these things we, we've shown, oh, I, I'm feeling a little sick. OK, I'm going to go drink a lot of water. Everybody's got their own way of approaching getting over a cold. I got a saying for that. My mom used to say there's more than one way to skin a cat. I don't know where to skin <laughs> My friend used to correct me all the time. He used to say, why do we have to skin the cat? We can pet the cat. There's many yeah. ways to pet the cat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I like, try to say what? many ways to pet a cat. I love this comment from, from Tim. No such thing as karma. Well, that will come back to bite him in the Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> karma will make itself known. 
uh, uh, is, uh, is the one thing again. And this is a real easy experiment you can do is back to the one where people have a script, just like God or Christ, they have uh, trouble struggling with the concept of we are all one. Well, right now I'm looking at this gentleman right here and he's one. But if I take an electron or a microscope and I go in, then all of a sudden he's thousands of cells with, with eons between each cell but then i go to one cell and it's one again then i go inside the cell and it's got you know the nucleus and the new uh, uh protons neutrons electrons so it's many again then i go to the nucleus of that and it's one again uh same with him now i get away from him and there's a bunch of us in the room we're many then i get up higher and it's one city then i get up higher and it's many countries and i get up higher and it's one planet and i get up higher and it's many planets wow. so distance so creates distance creates uh either separation or one out of one many out of many one it's all fractals yeah you know that is uh, <sighs> Like I said, I've been meditating on on this concept. You know, like that that the great distance, that fabric that exists in between everything, <laughs> and the idea that at the same time there's this fabric that's spread out, and it is spread out farther than we can possibly imagine. At the same time, it's all also simultaneously on <laughs> top of itself. Yeah, it's this itty bitty thing that is just on top of itself. Like, and I mean, this is the thing that like for a 3d thinker you know you're trying to like put everything in its proper place and to basically come to the the realization that everything is simultaneously very far and closer very than far. you can imagine and happening that, all now <laughs> yeah well and the idea that you know the nazi is 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 right in some capacity like, what do you mean how can anybody be right they they well, there are reasons and places that have brought this person to a point. And ultimately, even the Nazi is behaving from a place of self-preservation because they think that they're being challenged. They think that this is important to their own sustainment. That doesn't make it that it's the right choice, you know, and <laughs> and these things can balance back and forth. But it's. It is this dual dualistic bit where we're learning from each other and we're meant to be trying to get onto the same page. You know, like I'm trying to get onto the same page of Seth and be like, well, I remember a time when this would have seemed freaking bonkers to me. So, <laughs> you know, we are hanging out and listening. So, hey, yeah. Seth. Well, exactly. Really, really so, with that in mind, exactly. <laughs> It's also very exciting. I have somebody, you know, walk up to me any given day and they'll go, hey, what's happening? And I go, what's happening? Everything, everything's happening. So when somebody says to me, I'm bored, I say, you're not paying attention because there is nothing to be bored about. You could just walk out on your porch and sit on the porch and look at nature and have your mind blowing. So let alone everything that's happening around us and <laughs> with each other. What's happening? Everything is happening. It's amazing what's happening when you start paying attention. And, you're yeah. it. and they call it paying attention because there's a price to paying attention. That actual consciousness costs you something. You have to face your fear then. Because the more you start paying attention, the more you realize you don't know jack about anything. What we know is a grain of sand on the beach of eternity. You take the smartest man and the dumbest man, and they're on planet Earth, and they're as close as the hairs on your head, two hairs, to all there is to know. Okay, so... Wow, th th there's a really interesting thing, uh, uh, Walter, that, that that reminds me of. There used to be this guy who I knew who I thought was kind of stupid <laughs> and and just in that i didn't see like a lot of thought going into what he did and i'm somebody who probably overthinks things like crazy and at coming into contact with him he sort of reached out to me about um working out together because I, I had some shoulder problems and he had dealt with some shoulder problems and um you know he, he liked me or whatever he was like he was like yeah, come on down to the gym with me and um you know we'll work out together so i took him up on it even though i, I kind of had this judgment of him that he was maybe a little dumb and we went around and i watched him sort of float from one side of the gym to the other with not a care in the world and he kind of lit up the room wherever he went. And I realized that he was succeeding at not thinking 
at all. He he was not overdoing it, and his life was good. He had really nice relationships with everybody in the gym. You know, I just hung out with him for like an hour and a half, and just seeing him interact with everybody at the gym, I was convinced that like he was doing something right, and he was connected to the force or whatever it was, and he was always kind of saying the right thing for himself and in his place, and he was always bringing himself where he needed to bring himself. And I saw right there that my notion of intelligence, which was sort of like double checking and triple checking everything and studying everything so that I would know enough to be the right answer when the time came, like I was way overdoing it. And like, here's like overthinking Jesse. And here's this guy who was just kind of living and he was having so much success with so little effort. And, yeah. and, and it just demonstrated to me, like in an instance, you know, how, everybody was right you know and there was there was indeed many ways to pet the cat and and, and this right. was another one and i didn't maybe have to be quite so hard on myself and be quite so on top of trying to study all these things and ever since i have tried to kind of go into things and allow my intuition to lead the way um even though i still tend to be somebody who does a lot of studying and a lot of research because i like to understand where other people are coming from but um you know it, it's it's so true yeah. It's like, welcome to the now, you know, Eckhart Tolle built an entire career on the now. Why did he, why was he able to build that? Because essentially we all know inside ourselves, the power of now is all we have. And so, you know, he made a lot of money on those books and wrote several sequels to them. Okay. And, and it actually it works its way into my mantras. Uh, yeah. I think, the power I, think of now. So, I think he also <laughs> expressed himself in a way that reached a lot of people he that, did. that weren't necessarily reaching those conclusions right well, they knew them but they he just helped them get over the hump you know sometimes you reach people through yeah. the heart yeah. and then sometimes you reach people through the intellect now yeah. i find that the intellect to reach people through the intellect is oftentimes much tougher because if somebody thinks they know something then it's very hard to open their mind to something else especially okay. these days yeah so, I so many that. different yeah. schools of thought to take and have and it's it's really like the 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 mind of the universe has become very divided and it has a lot of different ideas about itself and um they're all right but in order to kind of have an influence on somebody in that fashion um you know, you got to understand where they're coming from, which takes a lot of listening and a lot of, you know, <laughs> you know, research on your own part to get where they're at. You know, somebody like Seth, like I, I get where he's coming from. I really do. Like, I, I, I'm like, honestly, I'm not bothered because I get it, man. I really do. I get it. I used to think that totally. everything that oh, I'm wait, saying is freaking insane. Seth but, is feeling that one. I like bone tart. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I wanted to, I wanted to say this earlier, you know, when it comes to all these things, and I guess I was trying to, to get at it, but that idea of not being able to force your opinion on other people. I think that there was, uh, I had personally, you know, if, if you're, if you're talking, uh, if you've been listening to the show long enough and you understand kind of the mechanisms of the universe, I was working against the mechanisms of the universe when I was younger, because it was in my mind, especially as an atheist, that I wasn't crazy and that all these other people who believed in religion, especially were freaking nuts. And I wanted to take a power position in creation as a songwriter, as a writer, so that I had a platform to, to zero in on what was real, you know, so that we could all get on the same page and we could make some progress in the universe. Cause I was tired that we weren't making any progress. Everybody's fighting about stupid things about God of all things. Who gives a shit about God? There's no God. Like th this is where I was at. And that continued even when I became spiritual, it finally came to my attention that my whole reason for being was kind of like my reason for educating myself, my reason for learning and, and getting better at what I was, was so that I could be better on the top of the mountain and tell everybody the way it's supposed to be. And then I went, oh shit. Uh, that is literally the opposite of what we're supposed to do. I'm not supposed to tell everybody. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not supposed to dictate to everybody what it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to find my own peace, find you know, make make my own decisions, come to my own conclusions, my own realizations, and then live in that you know, do unto others mentality to vibrate 
as love and understanding, you know, for anybody like Seth or whoever yeah. who might show up and and think differently than me. That's okay. I love it's you just the same. And, yeah, exactly. To be an example. Exactly. And not to not to get into a place of power so that you could control the system and you could change the others and force them to be different than they are today. You know, that's the, the really difficult thing to to withhold um, righteousness or rather self-righteousness, you know, because it's, it's 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 a good thing. Part of everything is to be humble, but also to be righteous and, and to know that you're doing the best that you can. But to be self-righteous where you think that you're thoughts and perspective on everything is the only way and you must transform the other perspectives around you into thinking that same way that's you know that that's the mistake that, that so many of us make that's kind of what we're experiencing so i just want to uh, acknowledge uh gabe gabe at house 99 who is one of the few people coming through on Twitch, he asked if this was live. I told him we were, and then he started to plug his his music, which is cool. Congratulations on your music video about. Oh, the that's great! Days. I hope some people check it out for you, Gabe. Yeah, I hope some people check it out. But I do see that the Nightbot is uh, warning you to stop posting. So <laughs> it's the Nightbot. She's and, gonna and get you. Sure Wait, who's the Nightbot? I, I'm, I'm not sure who Jeff Lowe is, but uh, <laughs> he thinks you're Jeff Lowe in, in costume. Oh no! <laughs> the night thought was, was just Twitch telling. Can me. I take that as a compliment, or was that an insult? I can't tell anymore. Yeah, we don't know. The guy okay. from Tiger King. Oh, <laughs> oh, nice! The guy from Tiger oh, King. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. love Tiger King. I, I didn't really get to see it. So much different than Jeff Lowe. So, you know, Walter, this was a very different um, interview for us than, than yeah. usual. And, you know, maybe we'll have you back on to expound at a longer uh, length about this. But what? was your journey this is the usual question and i'm going to ask you for the short version which is very different for us usually we ask for the long version of the story and like i said we'll have you back on to give us a longer version but what was your journey to consciousness you know we we all tend to come in essentially not realizing that there's anything wrong with the way that we're living because the majority of the people who we're learning from whether it be characters in films our moms and our dads the kids at school they're not living particularly consciously and they're not understanding the effect that they're having on you know the puddle or the ocean that uh, of all these people that they're living next to um so what was it on the journey that woke you up and made you go oh wow i'm not exactly in alignment with the the universe as it is well, that's an interesting one and, and probably a really common one is that I had reached the point in my life that I had had so many uncommon, tragic things happen that um, and a lot of people have died that I had. You lost a lot of people. Yes. And, and I also had a lot of opposition to who I was, who I was carving out as myself, finding my authentic self that I truly felt like I had nothing to offer anybody anymore. And what I had to offer wasn't wanted. So I was, I was toying with the idea of, you know, well, you know, does it really matter if I'm alive anymore? Not that I would have killed myself so much, but I did, you know, play around at the, I've been to the edge and I stood and looked down. I used to play on the edge of the roof all the time, you know, just going or standing by the subway car, just going, God, this would just be so easy. Just end the pain, just end it, you know, move on. But I decided you got to, to a really dark place personally yeah, where, yeah, where yeah. you were you were, where yeah. you 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 let the the negative experiences you were having overtake you and you were feeling I just like felt like I had nothing that anybody wanted that I had to offer. That's yeah. that would be the a death to me is that I had nothing to offer. There was nobody I could help. There was nobody I could love that was going to accept and allow me to be me. So I decided, OK, I'm going to do something. I'm going to take it to the level of, um, I'm going to ask God, listen, if I'm supposed to be here, then you're going to make it apparent and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to do so. So I had been talking to a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, who now we've been friends for years and years and years. And he introduced me to, um, uh, this idea of the shaman and working with the plants. And then I went on a road trip and on that road trip, I happened to discover, um, the condensed version of what it is to work with ayahuasca is what I'm speaking of right now, the plants, fine of the dead. And you can get the dimethyltryptamine uh, 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 condensed and, and do it a different way than with a shaman. You can also smoke it and it takes 15 minutes. That's and, DMT. Yeah, DMT. But you better, you you don't do this for, for uh, recreation. Recreation, no. <laughs> and I've been 
prepared for three or four months before I went in and, and got hold of it. And because I knew once I did it, that I had been communicating with it all along. It's in your mm -hmm. body. Yeah. You create it every day, time you dream when you're, you get a big burst when you're born and you get it when you die created from the pineal gland. And that's a whole nother story. So I went and I said, I, I, through this DMT experience, I, uh, I, I said, give me everything I could handle was my mantra for three months. And when mm -hmm. I finally got the chance to do it, it was amazing what I could handle. And it put me through levels of uh, awareness and fear and, and what really is occupying in the very fabric that we're sharing right now of um, reality that um, there was no more even toying about leaving this life. There was too much to learn and also too much to share once I learned it because it took a great burden off me. Number one, I knew I was forever for certain. I knew yeah. that this body is just an avatar. So then I started working with the plants and went down to Peru and started working with the shaman in the deep jungle and up in the uh, the deep uh, Amazon and as well as the top of the Andes a couple of years later. And I worked with several shamans that didn't even speak English. They came straight out of the jungle. How many years ago was this? Uh, like 2012, around, you know, the end of the world. Oh, nice. All right. So all of this led to uh, a reigniting of my joy of living. Not just living, but I have a joy of living, even when the world's fallen around behind around my ears. Um, so what did it take? Did it take me to spiritualism? No, it reintroduced it. What I had as a child that I had had smeared away through through abuse and trauma and tragedy. Uh, it, and it reintroduced it on a whole new level. And what I discovered was, you know, I'm not living for me. I forgot this main thing of that. You know, what's bigger than me? everybody else. Who is my example? Who set the example for me? Somebody that wasn't afraid to give their life, not just for one, but for all. So in a way, you know, it's very John Lennon, you know, the way, they go, the way things are going, they're going to crucify me. We're all being crucified. We're all being broken on the wheel. Uh, we're all the butterfly on the wheel. And now I understand that my highest goal right now, other than highest joy, highest creativity, highest abundance, and highest love, is highest service. Without service, all those things mean nothing. Meaning, tell my last breath, I am here to help people, communicate with people, use my skill sets as a singer, as a creator, as an artist, but also as a, a, an intellect in, in many ways, as a spiritual intellect, meaning that I have experienced things that most people haven't even dared to ever try. So um, I came back. And I came back and now you have to kill me before you shut me off. So it's pretty interesting because I was looking for excuses and ways to kill myself through rec recklessness and drugs and a party and doing all the crazy things I did before all the work with the shaman and the plants. So what they allowed me to do is heal on a, on a, on a depth that I can't even, it's like getting a spiritual colonic, having all these negative entities and stuff removed from you so that I could breathe, eat and, 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 and function again without, suffering 24 seven. Now what's amazing is that I have learned how to transmute like an alchemist, my suffering into whatever it is I want it to do. So it's, it's nothing but fuel. It's that is apparent. <laughs> You're not yeah. having the greatest week, but you are, uh, you are coming with a whole heart. Yeah. I wanted to comment on this uh, comment. Uh, Carrie Ann, she said, Oh, I love that. There's too much to learn came to you. And you know, <laughs> if, if you really want to see that Carrie, on, on like a large level, this is just one of the perspectives of the infinite perspectives. And from the single perspective, you have an infinite amount to learn. And then to learn it from another perspective is a completely different experience. So it really is this ongoing, um, you know, gift, you know, <laughs> of, of just of the universe experiencing itself or God experiencing itself. I, I want to say to wrap this up, cause we're getting towards the end of the show here, but, um, you know, it's very much comes off of what you're saying, Walter. Um, we all have one power, one ability that I believe trumps every other facet of who we are, no matter what we might think that we're good at or have the power to do. Everybody has the same ability to be positive, to give good feelings to other people. Uh, my girlfriend was talking to me the other day about a very good friend of hers. And she told me how 
it happened. She, she saw this friend who was walking home by themselves and she was driving in her car and she just kind of, I'd always seen this person kind of by themselves and just decided I'm going to go pick them up. And she didn't know just how much she was lifting this person up by pulling over, making a joke and saying, get in, you know, by validating that person, by validating another person's experience. You know, we all at any time, no matter how low we are, you know, a bum can come up to you on the street and say, wow, what beautiful eyes you have. And it means just as much than coming from some art critic, you know, who says what beautiful eyes you have, you know, you, you appreciate the validation, the support of the people around you. And to, to know that you can always give some of yourself, some of your energy to somebody else. It will always be appreciated. It is so true. Started with the simplest thing that I said earlier. What is, what is the way this guy greets people with a hug? It's like yeah. the first the first experience you have with him, he's giving you that exactly what you're saying. He's giving you that ability to feel good and be like, oh, <laughs> wow, totally, yeah. totally, exactly. And it's all yeah. that's very intentional. Yeah. And, you know, and, and Julie, uh, my, my, my girlfriend, you know, she she didn't even you know realize until her mother, uh, the, not her mother, but the friend's mother thanked her, pulled her aside one day and thanked her like you have no idea how important that was. You know, I know personally that, you know, I had an experience and I've actually had this experience a lot where there was somebody that I complimented, you know, like if I see you on the street and you've got cool, weird hair, that's different than other people, I'll probably say, Ooh, I really like your hair. And I'm, I'm very big on, uh, you know, they would always say, if you see something, say something. And uh, I used to hear that all the time when I was in Manhattan. And uh, I turned it into like, if I see it, like, if I have a good reason to give a, a sweet compliment to be nice to somebody, I'm going to, I'm going to say something. That's so, awesome. and I've seen it happen where like afterwards I was in a position, you know, whether I was in the building and there was an open window or whatever, where I was able to kind of observe the person I complimented after the fact. And I realized after the fact, what a big deal it was that I complimented that person. Like I could remember this one time where I complimented this kid as a teenager in front of his whole family and the, the whole family's there. And I just went, wow, man, this is really, I love, I love your hair. You look awesome. And he was like, oh, like he lit up like a Christmas tree, just like, oh, wow, thanks so much. And then I see his family who obviously had been kind of like making fun of him about the hair, but now somebody who seemed, you know, cool in their own right said that he was cool (laughs) and they like changed their whole mind about him. The whole family was like, Oh, look, you know, like, like people like your hair, man. Like it, it can change somebody's day, change somebody's night. Have you ever said something nice to somebody and had them go, Oh, wow. You just made my week. Oh, wow. You just made my day. That's the power that we all have every second of the day to, to lift people up. Yeah, that's the, the whole story about, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing yeah. awesome. That's, boom, that's the whole thing in a nutshell. And the power goes the other way, too. You know, and I, I say this, you know, to everybody, you know, like like Seth didn't really bother me this evening. I don't really care. But there there's a power in, in that. You know, the, the, the things that you say right. that are negative or can be construed as negative. You know, a lot of times... Um, you know, because I'll be talking about something, you know, like comic book stuff on, uh, I I'm on a channel called thinking critical. My, my buddy Wes, uh, uh, runs the site and, uh, and I'll go on his show and every now and then I'll have somebody like neg something I said or make fun of me or whatever. And <laughs> I, like, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll like go to go after them in the comments. And then I finally come back to a position where I'm like, you know what the truth is? The truth is you hurt my feelings. <laughs> like, like, you know, like that's the truth. The truth is you just hurt my feelings. That was, that was not nice that you said that. Like I, I came out and I, I was being honest and earnest and this is what I had to say. And I was just talking about comics and I love comics. And, and then you said all these things about me and they were mean, <laughs> you know, like you, you, you do have the ability to, to hurt somebody's feelings, you know, to, yeah, to make somebody okay. anxious and nervous, uh, you know, on a live stream or something like that. You're you know like, what? You got to realize the power that you have. Yeah, and and honestly, the immediate thought that I had when I saw Seth oh. starting to comment and saying the things was I felt bad for him. I mean, I was like, oh man, well, poor Here's guy. The, thing. the greatest poor guy, <laughs> greatest gift we can give is to allow everybody to explore and to be their authentic self. Yeah. What is the meaning of your life? You are the meaning. 
the whole purpose is there's no other part of the God or the, the one or source that's going to be expressed and express its way the way that you are. Nobody's going to have your voice. Nobody's going to have your perspective. Nobody's totally. going to have your perception. What we have to do without hurting each other is allow people to be who they are without enforcing our I, I, I ideologue. Uh, of how people should be uh, or how they should be. Should be. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, and then on the places where we actually do have to come up with some commonalities where we go, okay, let's all agree. We all want to live. You want to live? You want to live? You want to live? Orange whip, orange whip, orange whip. Okay. We all want to live. All right. So now we get that commonality. We can start with that. Now, do we all want to live and maybe have some joy along with it? Yeah. Joy. Yes. Joy. Well you know, exactly. And you know what, when it comes down to it as an outsider, if I was a third perspective, like here's us being crazy people. And then here's <laughs> Seth having his perspective. And then here's a third perspective. Well, maybe they're crazy, but they seem to want everybody to be happy. <laughs> they, they seem to generally care about the other people yeah, around right. them. I, I don't think they're going to do anything bad. But right. already, Seth, you've started to open your mouth and you seem kind of negative. <laughs> like, you know, like it's, if you just look at it on the surface level, it, it's kind of easy to say who you, well which side do you want to go with i'd rather be with the crazy people who are doing no harm I'm and, with and the that's bone beards. <laughs> yeah. the bone beards yeah. Right. yeah yeah and you know what he it's driving me crazy he he gave me crap about using the word uh, prophetizing and, and maybe i'm and maybe i'm and maybe i'm uh, maybe i garbled it when i said it but he was like what word is that that's a word that's I'm, 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 I'm not I, i'm not exactly i just wrote it in my script the other day because it literally came out of like i had to research bible stuff for this comic book that i'm writing but prophetizing it means to go out and, and be prophesizing and, and and be tell trying to tell everybody what the meaning of of reality is um, it's a word. I, 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 I might have garbled it when I said it. It might have sounded like gibberish to you, but, but it's a word. It's a I'm, like, word. I'm like, I'm an English major, yeah. motherfucker. <laughs> that was the one thing he said that bothered me. Everything else I was cool with. I'm like, hey, that is a word. You know that we all, you know how we come up with our language. We all agree. We create words every day, and we all agree that that's a word. Uh, that's Mass what psychosis, what, what is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that doesn't we, exist. <laughs> we got to wrap up this show. I got my girl looking really cute, and um, we're, we're going to be going to see a movie in a little bit. Oh, nice. um, I wanted to um, – I'm doing a funny gig. Uh, it's funny because I'm, I'm playing with the band that I've been putting together, except we got a filling guitar player. So we came up with a, a name for the one gig that we're doing – um, because most of us are dads. We're called DILF. Um, <laughs> I think there's a, a poster on my Facebook, uh, my, my pro Facebook. If you find it, it's for Saturday night at a place called The Last Call. It used to be called Petey's Place, Please. I think. Um, so uh, it's first time I'm like playing in a little or first time I'm playing this year. Um, but yeah, uh, more, more gigs that, in the new year. I'd like to fraternitize with. <laughs> yes, it, it's 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 a uh, devoted, involved, <laughs> loving father. Uh, <laughs> so uh, before we wrap up, I yeah. do want to make a special announcement. Uh, oh, yeah. What do you got? We have something really cool happening on Monday. Oh, we do. It's true. Um, I am so pumped about it. Um, it's going to be at a different time than normal. Uh, it's a special episode of the live stream of consciousness. Are we it's actually going to do it live on Monday? I thought we were going to. No, I was like, oh, okay. okay. All right. Have, we want people to have the opportunity. All right. To All right. Fair enough. All right. Well, I didn't know about this. He's calling an audible, <laughs> but on Monday, we will be live with our very special spiritual guest. Would you like to tell them, Michael? Tommy Chong from Cheech and Chong. Super yeah, excited. we're that's, very excited to uh, to chat with Tommy Chong. He's somebody who has been on the plant medicine path for a very long time, and I think maybe he started on that path um, with some of the uh, for some of the wrong reasons. But uh, he, I've seen you know Tommy talk uh, you know recently. He's a very uh, very spiritual and deep guy, and I'm very excited to have him on the show. Yeah, the reason he's coming on the show is a friend of mine had him on his podcast. And he started talking about consciousness and awareness. And my friend Matt said, wow, you would love these guys at the live stream of consciousness. And boom, there the universe do does its magic. And uh, 
Monday, Tommy Chong. Uh, it'll be a special uh, time, right? It's going to be 3 o'clock my time, 12 o'clock your time? No, 6 4 20. 6 o'clock my time. Oh, 6 o'clock Michael's time, 3 o'clock my time. So 6 3 Western. <laughs> yes. Not 420? Not 420, unfortunately. Oh, that's funny. Well, maybe we'll call it a show at 420 yeah. oh, on yeah. my time. There you go. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much, Walter, for coming on the show. Oh. We so appreciate you being here. Uh and um more, so I'm, yeah. I'm very- but uh, life is good, and uh, it'll keep being that way. Thank you, Seth, for dropping by and giving us some content for our show. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, and thank you to everybody, as always, our loyal audience in the comments and uh, everybody who isn't in the comments, who is uh, loyally showing up every week to uh, listen to us talk about the things that we value so much, our community, our spirituality, our consciousness. And we hope you will join us again next week for a special live stream of consciousness at 3 6 Eastern with Tommy Chong. See you next time. Peace. Peace.